Please be seated. So today we are starting a month of thinking and talking about the Holy Spirit, that invisible wind that blows in our lives. We said in Sunday school today that you can't control the wind, but you can adjust your sails. So today we're going to slightly adjust our sails and try to pick up some of that holy wind that's blowing through our church and through our lives and through the whole world. And so we took a line from the prayer that Aaron read for us. Send your spirit of truth. And I loved what Jesus said. We printed this in your bulletin. You should have a yellow insert. We'll go over that really quickly. Jesus said, Holy Father, keep them that they may be one. Even as we are one. A lot of times in church, obviously, we ask, well, what does Jesus want us to do? I want you to be one, even as we're one. Well, what do you want us to do about this? I want you to be one, even as we are one. This is Jesus' prayer. This is his goal. This is his will. He's not subtle. He may not answer the question we're asking about the, um, you know, what's an issue we have? Where should we go to lunch today? I think we should go to Virginia Diner. We pass it on 460. I'm not calling for a vote now. I'm just saying I think that's what we should do. But Jesus says as long as you're doing it and it's leading you to be one, he doesn't really care what we do. What does Jesus want us to do? He wants us to be one. That's right. So we made several points here, and we're going to go over this during the sermon. Does God play dice with the universe? Is it all just sort of random happenstance? We're going to talk about that. And if there is really a Holy Spirit blowing, if it's not just random... Then who is this Holy Spirit different from Satan? So the Holy Spirit versus Satan, our shepherd versus our separator. And then finally we're going to talk about truth. It's the spirit of truth. And truth really isn't a fact. It's not hard, cold steel or wood. Truth is a relationship. You know, in the Bible, we used to joke about this because we grew up reading the King James Version. You know, in the Bible when they say to know someone, you know, Adam knew his wife Eve. You know, you snicker at that, but that's what we're talking about, knowing people personally. Instead of knowing facts and, you know, things like that. So that's how we're going to explore this today. Um, I have a very short joke. Um, a lady asked, how many men does it take to change a toilet paper roll? And the answer is nobody knows. It's never been tried. <laughs> the idea is, is there a truth? Is there, you know, something hard empirical data that we can look to? Um, the most simple thing to think about is, is where's God? You know, there's the old joke about the two little boys who are always getting in trouble. And the mom decides, I'm going to just take them to the pastor. And so the pastor sits one outside his office and brings one in. And he just doesn't know where to begin. He says, Johnny, do you know where Jesus is? And he wanted him to say in his heart. But Johnny just sat there, stone cold. He wouldn't say, Johnny, I'm just asking you, where is Jesus? And he wouldn't say anything. And he said, well, why don't you go send your brother in? And he went out and got his brother. He said, be careful. Jesus is missing and they think we did it. <laughs> There's a famous theologian named Mar Martin Buber. I think I said his name right. Uh, he talked about you and me, basically. He, he created this whole concept of you and me and knowing the other and knowing ourself. Oh, bless you, sweetheart. Can you bring that up here to me? Thank you so much. I've been yakking for over an hour, so I'm thirsty. Martin Buber told the story of a rabbi who asked his friends at dinner, where does God live? And they said, that's a ridiculous question. We're rabbis. We know the whole earth is filled with his glory. And the rabbi said, no. God lives where he's allowed to come in. Remember last week we talked about that revelation story where Jesus is standing at the door and knocking. And we think it's about sinners coming to repentance, but he's talking to the church. He's asking us every day, will you let us come in? Will you open the doors? Will you open the gates of your heart and let us come in? So that's what we're really going to look at today. The first question is, does God play dice with the universe? You know, that's what Albert Einstein said, right? He said, God doesn't play dice with the universe. That's where we get that from. But let me set the stage of what Aaron read. Remember a couple weeks ago, we had this big group of thousands of people. Peter called them all together and he said, appoint deacons to make sure we're helping everybody in the church. We got all this money, we got all this property, we got all this food, but let's make sure all the widows get what they want. And you guys appoint people to make sure that gets distributed. And that was the one hallmark they said was these men should be filled with the Holy Spirit. But today we have a prequel, a movie before that story. Today it's smaller. Instead of thousands of people, you have 120 people. 
And instead of being out in the streets and preaching in the temples like that story, they're in a little upper room, kind of hiding, kind of afraid. It was before the Holy Spirit and after the Holy Spirit. And you are about to see the difference between night and day. But one thing those little group of disciples had, the same thing we had. The Bible said today they were devoted to prayer and to unity. Aaron read that phrase, they were in one accord together with all the women. The men and women too were together and they were just grappling for God. God, we want more of you. And I love that when Peter finally wanted something done. He's always impetuous, right? Peter's always the one to step forward and say, let's do it right now. But his heart's inclination was for unity. He stood up and he said, let's have a consensus. We've got this disciple, Judas, who was in charge of, he was our treasurer, he was in charge of our finances, he betrayed Jesus, and he's gone now, he's dead. Let's replace him. What do y'all think? And he did it together. But remember that story after the Holy Spirit, he did that with 3,000 people. He got everybody together and he said, y'all just appoint seven people that you can trust that are filled with the Holy Spirit and full of wisdom that will distribute these funds to the, all the widows, right? So his inclination is good toward unity and consensus. But I often wonder with this story if he wasn't a little rash, if he wasn't little Peter. I mean, we know Peter, right? He jumps out of the boat naked to go see Jesus at the last breakfast. He walks on the water. He's the one that says to Jesus, well, about every time somebody opens their mouth, it's always Peter. But I have been reading a lot of Old Testament stories. We do our children time with Old Testament. We do a lot of Bible study with Old Testament. And one thing I've learned in the Bible is when somebody does something in the Bible, it's not necessarily the right thing to do. Sometimes people in the Bible make mistakes. And I think this was the first mistake in the church. Because even though they said they were committed to praying and waiting for God to act, they weren't. They said, while we're praying, if you could just hold your hands there steady, we're going to hold a, a meeting over here. And we're going to elect somebody to replace Judas. And the reason I think it was a mistake was when you think of an apostle in the New Testament, who do you think of? Paul. He wrote half of the book of the New Testament. I think the Holy Spirit already knew. But this little group didn't know. All they saw was their little world, right? We don't even know who this Paul is. Who's Paul? If the Holy Spirit had knocked on the door and said, Hey, I got Apostle Paul. He's right out the door. His name is Saul. You don't know him yet. They wouldn't have known him. And then when the church started growing and there were 3,000 people and they're out there beating the streets and healing people and seeing dynamic changes, Saul was their greatest enemy. He was the one that drugged Stephen, that first deacon, and threw him down the ground and held all the coats while the guys nailed him with rock after rock until he died, saying, God forgive him. But I think the Holy Spirit knew who he wanted to take the place of Judas. I love this story because, and you take it or leave it, I think that it was a mistake that the first church made by appointing something too quickly. And it's interesting, after they prayed, and after they had a meeting of everyone, nothing wrong with those two things, how did they end up deciding? What did, what did Aaron tell us? How did they decide on the replacement? They rolled the dice. They rolled the dice. That's how their election went. They said, God, give me snake eyes. Oh, it's, that's how they chose the next official. And I thought about, obviously, that quote from Einstein where he said, God doesn't play dice with the universe. Einstein was arguing against some guys. There was this theory of um, um, Newton. You know, he decided how the planets circle around. And he almost got it right, how the planets circle around. But every time they tested it, I was like, wait a minute, that planet is slightly off. That doesn't make sense. And so finally, Newton just gave up. And he said, you know what? It must be the finger of God. <laughs> so the planets are working like I say they should work on my formula. But God's just like poking his finger and moving planets little by little. And Einstein came along and he created incredible theories. He had three different theories, right, that changed the world. But he couldn't get out of that old view of Newton's mechanical world where if you knew enough about everything, you could predict everything. And along come these people like Heisenberg who have the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and these other people are doing something called quantum mechanics. And they're saying, no, you can't know everything. You can't know everything. I look on my phone and it says a 60% chance of rain. It doesn't say, yes, it's going to rain. No, it's not going to rain. Because life isn't like that. 
And we know in our hearts that's true, but poor Newton and poor Einstein couldn't handle it. He said, no, God doesn't roll the dice with the universe. But actually, I think God does. What we found out when we broke away from that and started moving to quantum mechanics that, where's Ellen, Shirley Ellen? Her husband worked for years for the phone company, right? Phone company's job is to plug in a wire here, run that wire all across town and plug it into my little grandma's alcove that's stuck beside the bathroom that you couldn't talk long distance for very long because it's an expensive call. And you're on the phone, I mean, you are connected. There's no way you can lose that line. But now we have kids. I got a text message from Sydney Jolly who got a new cell phone for her birthday last night, you know, thanking me for coming. Very sweet kid. And she's on a cell phone. You know, there's no connection with cord. It may cut off. It may not be able to send the message right away. It's like, because we base cell phone technology on quantum mechanics, the idea of probabilities. Well, there's an 80% chance that the signal is going to work right now. But maybe in six minutes it won't. Maybe it will. And we trust things don't have to be reliable and predictable and controlled and guaranteed because that's really how the world works. If you roll a dice, let's say we're rolling, and it comes up a six or a one, those seem like very different numbers on the surface, right? If I roll a four, what is the hidden number, the secret number on the bottom of that dice? Come on. I can't be the only one that plays. Three. If I roll a six, what's the secret hidden number on the bottom? One. If I roll a five, I'm glad to see you're good Christians. You don't gamble. You don't know that much about dice. If you roll a five, there's a two hidden. Every number you roll has a secret hidden part underneath the bottom that always adds up to the same thing. Seven. God's number of completeness. In this world where we live, in this spiritual world, there is always a hidden part. Theologians call our church the church invisible and the church visible. And we've got books and books written on that. But a little fellow named Jesus Christ, and he probably was little, he said it much simpler. He said, look, you're going to plant a field in life, and there's going to be some weeds, and there's going to be some wheat, and you're going to want to go in and pull out the weeds, but you're going to damage the wheat. Just let them all grow together. And when the harvest time comes, I'll send my angels and he'll remove the wheat, the weeds, the weeds, the bad stuff. We think of rapture like taking the good people home. That's not what the Bible talks about. Take out the weeds and then harvest the wheat and we'll have a feast together. I think the Holy Spirit works that way. The Holy Spirit, in Lutheran terms, I'm going to give you a little Lutheran. We're not all Lutheran here, but we wrote a, a big book that took us almost 80 to 100 years to write. It was Lutherans trying to agree on what we believe. And if you do not think that takes 100 years, you don't know Lutherans. <laughs> and finally, we came up with this big book. And of that whole book, one of my favorite lines, he says, what is the church? And it says, the church are those whom the Holy Spirit has gathered together. That's the whole definition of the church. And I tell you, it is true. When people come to church, I know it's exactly who God wanted to come. When we have a big crowd, it's great. When we have a small crowd, it's great because I know God has gathered us together. And more than that, the church isn't just who we see visible. The church is the church invisible who God has gathered together. God may not truly play dice with the universe, but God plays quantum mechanics. The second point we talked about was the Holy Spirit versus Satan. The Holy Spirit. Now, that's a, that's a rumble in the jungle I would like to see, right? That's every movie. Good versus evil, bad versus... But I'm going to take a look at this differently because it's also from Peter. Aaron read us from Peter. Remember the same guy who stood up before? Let's have a meeting. Let's decide. Let's get in control. What I love about that scripture I didn't tell you is Peter is praying... And Peter's got consensus. Those are good things. And Peter brings up the word of God, which we're supposed to follow. But did you hear what Aaron read us? Those two scriptures don't match. The first scripture says, let no one dwell in his place. Leave it empty. Leave his chair blank. And then he quoted another scripture that said, let another take his office. If Peter had listened for five seconds to those two scriptures and the fact that one says to leave it empty and one says to fill it, then that's a hint that filling it right now probably ain't what the scripture's telling you to do. So that impetuous Peter that always wanted to do something, couldn't wait. Now we hear Peter saying a different story. Peter is saying, 
we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. What's the hand of God? In the Simpson movie, my uh, boss at the Air Force chapel, uh, chapel at Langley Base will not let me use Simpson references anymore. Because um, he doesn't think it's theologically sound. But I think it's a great example. In the Simpsons, whenever the hand of God reaches down into Simpson world, how many fingers are on God's hand? Five. And how many fingers does every character in the Simpsons have on his hand? Four. So the idea is the Simpsons are created by us. And God's hand in the world is going to be obviously bigger than our world. I don't make fun of The Simpsons because The Simpsons is the only show on TV anymore that has a family that regularly goes to church and talks about God and our faith issues. So I love that show. But we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. What's the hand of God if it's not the Holy Spirit working in our lives, our faithful creator? But listen to why we humble ourselves. Listen to what Peter learned from his experience being filled with the Holy Spirit and seeing ups and downs and ins and outs and jail and freedom. He said we do this because at the proper time, not when we want, not when we think it should, but at the proper time, God may exalt you. So cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. That is a powerful, powerful scripture. But Peter wants us to be aware that there is a spiritual battle going on for your soul. There is something spiritual out there that wants you. Wants you like a lion, wants a lamb, wants to put you in his mouth and throw you around like a rag doll. We went to a lot of auctions and yard sales over the years. Before we had children, every single Saturday we'd go to yard sales and get our dogs 25 cent stuffed animals. And then we would give them to the dogs. And ten minutes later, there would be nothing left but fluff and stuffing. But it was fun until we got children who had actual stuffed animals. And that was a different story. So Peter tells us to be sober-minded, to be aware, to watch out. He says, quote, your adversary, in Hebrew the word adversary means Satan. Have you ever heard of the word Satan? So it just means your opponent, your adversary. Your adversary, Satan, the devil... Devil is where we get that word diabolos. It's the Greek word for devil. It means to divider, separator, slanderer. That's what devil means. It's the one who divides, the one who accuses. The Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Know the difference between the Holy Spirit and the evil spirits. It's not complicated. You can tell by what they do. The real spirit, the spirit of truth, exalts you, cares for you. The false truth, the false spirit, will prowl and try to consume your life. And when you see that, you know what you're dealing with. Is this the Holy Spirit? Is this something else? Is this my enemy, Satan, the devil? What we believe is the spirit of truth that comes acts the same way. Always to care, always to protect, always to unify, always to hold us close like a mother holds her child. And so point number three is what is truth? You remember Pilate asked Jesus that? Jesus didn't even really answer him. What is truth? Truth is a relationship. Genesis has it right. To know someone is about a personal connection. It's not about knowledge. I think a lot of you know I serve on a board of something called the Center for Emotional Intelligence and Human Relation Skills. Or so. It's a long title. We're thinking about shortening it. <laughs> and um, Aaron and I were dealing with some issues that are going on in the church. And we contacted one of the leaders in our denomination. He sent us a great article. And it was written by, or si someone cited in it, was a guy named Roy Oswald. And Roy is the one who started this center that I work with. Well, Roy Oswald has, Reverend Oswald has a new book coming out. It's in the publishers right now. It's on Jesus and emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is the way you're aware of what's going on inside of you so that you can genuinely be present with people around you without being anxious. So you don't get riled up by their riling, but you're able to kind of have what we call a nap, a non-anxious presence in every situation. But it comes from maturity and being able to process your own emotions and handle things. And he, I said, well, what's this book, bottom line, bullet it down to me? And he said, you know what I find? Jesus thinks, and he, it's a direct quote, he said, relationships are sacred. I said, wow, 
Your whole book, it comes down. He said, I think that's what Jesus... He said, Jesus would go to the temple, the building, the property. He'd say, tear this temple down and I'll rebuild it. He would go to the money changers. He would flip over the tables, right? So the money wasn't important. He would go to the, the leaders, the Pharisees. He respected them. He blessed them. But he would go to them and he would call them hypocrites and snakes as quick as anything. He would listen to their rules. And he seemed to say... You make these rules for some people, but you don't live by them yourself. I'm confused. So he didn't really care about the building and the rules and the, the, the structures that we have. But what did Jesus care about? He cared deeply about it. He said, if you've got your gift and you're going to the temple, you leave that on the altar and you turn around and you go reconcile. He said, I don't, I don't need your gifts. I don't need your building. I don't need your anything. What you need is each other. I want you to be one. Relationships are sacred. So the difference to know someone personally or to know something impersonally. Look, you all know this is true. In a marriage relationship or friendship, you pick that person for a reason. That person's got 80% of what you want in life, right? A relationship will fall apart when instead of focusing on your thankful for the 80%, you begin to focus on the 20% that that person doesn't have. And I guarantee you, once you do that, that 20% is going to win and you're going to fall apart. Faith Lutheran Parish has the most beautiful corner in all of Prince George. Amen. Amen. Faith Lutheran Parish has one of the best preachers in the entire county. Amen. <laughs> Faith Lutheran Parish... One, one of my council members came to me the other day and said, that sermon you preached about Stephen and the deacons, you made us sound like the best council on earth. Yes! Because we have a great council. And I exalt them and I care for them and I lift them up. Why? Because they got 80% of what I need. They got 80% of what we need as a church. They're doing 80% of their best. Are they perfect? No. Am I perfect? No. And I said, yes, I made them look like the best because they are the best. They're the best counsel we've got. Another person on the council came to me and said, you know what? You've given us everything we want here. Good preaching. We're growing. And I, I took that as the same thing, a focus on what we're doing best. So what I want us to take away is the spirit of truth filling us up and finding what is really true. Not right and wrong, good and bad, but the truth that Jesus has pulled us together and called us together for a reason. Because He wants us to be one. Amen. Amen. So now we are going to...